My name is Naomi Stead and I am a Professor and Head of the Department of Architecture at Monash University. And this series, Light at the End of the Tunnel, is a collaboration between Parla and Monash Architecture. As always, we begin with an acknowledgement of country. Um, and on behalf of Parla, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country across many nations and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. And in particular, acknowledge the people of the Greater Kulin Nations, um, who are the traditional custodians of the lands on which Monash operates. We pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of the Parla community. Um, as, a, as you may know, this is a series. Uh, this, in fact, is the 12th in the series, Light at the End of the Tunnel. And I was making quips last week about how the tunnel's getting longer and the light feels like it's getting further away for those of us in Victoria. But uh, that is more reason to continue rather than less, I would say. Um, the series looks into architecture as a profession, discipline and practice and how it will be affected by the pandemic. Although, of course, we are also opening to larger questions, including today. This week, our two guests are Sonia Sarangi and Kataiba Al-Atafi. Sorry, Kataiba, I did practice that. You did, did well. um, <laughs> um, and this is the first of two sessions focused on cultural diversity. And in particular, in this session, we're particularly interested in individuals and how they negotiate cultural diversity. Justine will introduce Kataiba and Sonia in a moment, uh, but first some protocols for the session. Um, as always, please make sure your microphone is on mute unless you're actually speaking. Uh, please, we, we ask you to please leave your camera on if you're willing to do that. It's very nice to be able to see your faces and feel a sense of connection. So if you have the capacity and the willingness, please do leave your camera on. The format is Q&A style. It's supposed to be informal but informative. Uh, Justine and I will be asking questions uh, throughout and keeping things flowing, but we also take questions from the floor throughout as well. So please, if you have a question, put it into the chat function. That's how we, let's say, um, select them. And then we will ask selected people to pose their questions verbally live to our speakers. So we'll throw to you if you're willing. Um, please feel free also to add your own observations and experiences into the chat. Um, it's always very interesting to hear what you think about what's being said and whether you've had experiences that align with that or not. And over the past 12 weeks, we've seen new business um, opportunities emerge in the chat. We've seen uh, mentoring relationships established and all sorts of wonderful things have been happening in that parallel narrative. We won't unfortunately get to all of your questions, but please, um, please pose them anyway and they may inform uh, the topics of subsequent sessions. Um, Justine and I didn't actually talk about this, but I suppose in this case, it's also worth reminding you of what you already know about, which is that this is a supportive and safe space and we expect everyone to be civil um, and um, sensitive and non-discriminatory in their comments and questions. Now, uh, I'd like to throw to Justine to introduce Sonia and Kateba. Everybody, thanks, Naomi. Um, so as Naomi said, um, Today's session is actually the first of two looking at uh, cultural diversity. This is a topic that we at Parla have a long and slow interest in and which Sonia, among many others, has encouraged us to pursue. Um, we've published a number of pieces over the years, including one um, some years ago by Sonia, which uh, really kick-started the conversation for us. Um, we've got very little data about the um, cultural makeup of Australian architecture, but there's a vast amount of lived experience. And so unlike our work on gender, which um, has got a really strong base in a big research project, when we're, when we're looking at um, a cultural diversity, we're really drawing on people's experience and hoping that uh, that might itself initiate a kind of research project also into the future that someone might pick up. Um, we do have some data and the data we have comes from the Parler Census Report. Um, and this show reveals a really broad diversity in cultural backgrounds within Australian architecture. In uh, 2016, 41% of people who um, identified themselves as architects through the census were born outside Australia. Um, and I include myself in that figure. Um, and more than half of the people who, you know, who answered the survey as architects have one or more parent, one or more of their parents born overseas, 55% um, compared to a national figure of 49%. Now, this is a really crude way to measure cultural diversity, <laughs> like very, very crude. We know that. Um, but it's the kind of measure that we had available through the census. 
Um, this uh, wide diversity in ethnic origin among architects is not, however, fully reflected in the senior levels of, of the profession or in its public culture. So for this session, we want to focus on navigating cultural difference and diversity as individuals. Um, if we do want to um, ensure that the more senior levels of the profession better reflect the diversity of the profession as a whole and the communities we serve, how do we better support people to rise through the practices, the systems, the processes? What needs to change and what can we all do to help ourselves and others? So today we are interested in uh, what strategies we might suggest for navigating cultural difference and the biases and discriminations that some individuals may face as they chart their career. Um, the next session, which may well be next week, I think it will be, but we will just, I'm just trying to line up availability of, of our speakers for that, is going to look at uh, creating and managing workplaces that are very actively inclusive of cultural diversity. So the two-parter um, aspect. So as, as Naomi said, to help us uh, start this discussion, we've got two wonderful architects, both of whom are now themselves in leadership positions and both with many stories to tell and uh, some great advice to offer. So Sonia, as you know, as some of you, those of you who attended the mentoring session, uh, Sonia, you'll, you'll know, is the director of Atelier Red and Black. She's a mother of two. She teaches at Melbourne School of Design um, in Architectural Practice and Asia Pacific Modernism. So welcome back, Sonia. Um, and Kateba El Atafi is an associate at Woolbridge Architects, also here in Melbourne. He's practiced uh, locally in Melbourne and briefly in Japan. He's a finalist in the 2020 Dulux Study Tour. Um, he's a qualified Nashers residential building energy consultant and seeks to embed genuine evidence-based, ecologically sensitive design into more mainstream architectural practice. Um, he says that he relishes, which is a great word, relishes the opportunity to mentor young architects in his taught design studio and sat on review panels in Deakin and Melbourne. Kateba grew up and was educated in New Zealand, yay, and was born in Iraq. <laughs> so welcome both of you. Um, we're very, very happy to have you here. Um, and we thought we might start the conversation by talking about um, I guess the kind of positive side of this, because I know there are some a fair number of horror stories, but let's start um, by talking about the opportunities that different cultural viewpoints bring. Um, a few years ago, Sonia wrote a piece for Parler that ended in the words, a diverse profession isn't a handicap, it's an asset that we need to tap into. And I wondered if you both might talk a little bit to get the conversation going about the opportunities that um, different cultural viewpoints bring. And I know that you both have, you know, quite, um, you know, complex cultural backgrounds. And so you, you're not just bringing one or even two viewpoints. You're, I mean, often you're bringing three, I think, or at least, I don't know, anyway. So, so what are the opportunities um, personally and in terms of the profession? I know that's a huge question. So let's just start with, um, start where we start and see where we get to. So who wants to go first? Sonia's rearing to go. <laughs> well, and just before we do that, Justine, can you um, unshare oh, your screen? Yes, God, I know you have to ask me this every week, Naomi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I see a few familiar faces there. So it's, thanks for this platform again. Um, I'll start with the personal, and you're right, I probably bring a couple of different perspectives. Uh, my background is Indian, but I've spent a large part of my life in the Middle East and a large part of my working life in Southeast Asia, Singapore. So you're right, I probably bring a few different um, perspectives to this. Personal point of view. Um, I met, I think I wrote this in my parlor piece. I had a brief conversation with Julie Eisenberg at the end of uh, one of the architecture conferences. And I said, I really wanted to answer a question you asked, but I was too hesitant um, because I feel like an outsider. And she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, being an outsider is great. You question things that others don't. And that's what I would start from a personal point of view. So a brief anecdote, I remember being a freshly hired graduate um, taken to a council meeting and sitting there while uh, my boss at that point um, and the planner were having a very civil bun fight. Um, and I'm sitting there with very little, uh, obviously, practical experience in the industry going, okay, there is a third option. 
can they both not see this? And to me, it was very clear because I was bringing other filters in and I was questioning an assumption in the current, in the current framework of whatever it was we were discussing and going, yeah, but if we question this part, we could just do that. And I'm sitting there going, do I speak? Do I not speak? And at the end of the meeting, just as we were packing up, I kind of casually tossed in and went, uh, perhaps we could have a look at this aspect to the planning officer. Of course, going, if this goes pear-shaped, I'll just go, don't worry, we'll get back to you via email. The planning officer stopped. My boss glared at me. Planning officer smiled. He goes, now that's making progress. Boss looks at me, smiles and go, oh my God, you're at this meeting? I didn't even know you were at this meeting. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a really good example of, you know, just questioning what you're seeing and bringing those other filters in. You see things that others don't. And you can ask that most important question, which is why? Why does this have to be this way? Um, which the two other people who were in the conversation, who know the planning scheme backwards, who know, you know, Melbourne architecture to a much better level than I did at that point, they weren't asking the why, the different why. Um, so if you then take it beyond the personal to the profession, this applies very broadly just as much because as a profession, we're grappling with so many things in Australia. We're grappling with relevance, we're grappling with density, we're grappling with uh, climate change, we're grappling with the impact of the work that we do on the planet, all these things. All of these need different ways of looking at problems that have plagued us for quite a while. So I really believe that if the profession has more different filters looking at these problems, instead of spiraling and you know, attacking the same problem in the same way, we can start taking different routes. And I think that's part of what cultural diversity can bring. Excellent. Good neighbor. Okay, but I might add to that. <clears throat> No, I think you captured it pretty well. It, it, it really boils down to um, having complex problems and architects are probably good, well-placed to solve complex problems and even more so if they've got a few more lenses to look at complex problems through, you know. Um, I mean, I suppose I, I was sort of, I, I need to be a bit careful in not sort of talking in generalities. I'll, I'll be careful um, throughout this as well. And I instead will sort of share more my view uh, about it um, and um, <clears throat> I think it's all you know in in my experience it's uh, uh, growing up a, a Middle Eastern person um, and I've even shared this with the guys at work um, in that um, we people from from my upbringing tend not to uh, not to uh, uh, be hindered by politeness, I suppose, um, and and we're a lot more blunt, um, and I think that could be good. I suppose there's a critical mass in a bunch of big personalities in one room. It might become uh, like counterproductive, um, but I think that does help. That the it's not just the the lens, I suppose, but also the approach to solve problems uh, might be uh, uh, diverse uh, and and different. Uh, and provided, I think we don't, um, it's done in a way where it's not, you know, it's not cross um, cross purpose. So we're sort of pulling in the same direction. Um, yeah, and it's funny, like yeah, it's. It, <laughs> people from certain cultures and backgrounds and uh, they, they have a, a, a certain baggage um, and they see things in a different way and they receive things in a different way and they output things in a different way. And on the other side of things, that's why there's biases in there because people think that that's what you're going to do, you know? So um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. I, I just thought I'd just point at something that I'd, this, you know, just ran, they walked into in my life, so, yeah. Um, and I have to add in here, there is, I'm pretty certain, a very well-documented phenomenon called groupthink, which is if you get five people in a room and go, all right, we're going to have a brainstorming session, and all those five people are very similar in their lived experiences, um, 
they're not going to come up with as wide a variety of ideas as if you get five very different people into a room and say, just throw all your ideas onto a paper. Mm. You know, I was really, um, Justine and I were talking about this yesterday, but I was absolutely struck by um, the dangers of um, lack of diversity in decision-making teams during the pandemic, when um, not only did the, you know, was there insufficient um, uh, translation of pandemic related material into more than one language beyond English, but also I'll never forget it when Scott Morrison stood up in front of the nation and said, the kids won't get to see their grandparents for a while, which of course is entirely colorblind and completely glosses over the fact that in many cultures, the grandparents are living with the kids, you know, which is of course, you know, potentially risky for the grandparents in terms of infection and so forth. Um, but if the government is seeing from a kind of white male, dare I say, um, perspective and making dis policy decisions and uh, political decisions based on a lack of diversity, then if this is a danger to us all and we're living it right now. So it seems to me this is quite a powerful instance of um, what you're saying, S Sonia, that um, a lack of diversity in decision making is actually dangerous. Yeah, agree. Well, and dangerous to us all, I mm -hmm. think. Of it's always been dangerous to them. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Where are we at? Um, I mean, I'm really interested in that that um, sort of tension you just spoke about, Kateba, about um, ten. You know, we're all kind of acculturated to op to perform to behave in certain ways, um, and that that both plays into your uh, plays into stereotypes. So these st stereotypes can be incredibly, um, you know, they, they they kind of come out of patterns of behavior, but then they can also really be quite limiting. And so I, I guess, um, is the question issue that those are particularly problematic when there's um, not a, a kind of inclusive understanding of those kinds of different modes of being in the world, um, which, which some of which are culturally determined, some of which are determined through you know, personality, all sorts of other class, all sorts of other things. But how do we, um, and I think Sonia, what you were saying, you know, of having all um, many diverse viewpoints in a room, avoiding group think, can be incredibly productive. And I guess this will go to the topic next week, but how you uh, set the stage for those conversations and uh, can really affect whether the contribution can be useful or is received in a way that's useful or is received in a way that's kind of just filtered through a kind of stereotype bias of, um, you know, expectations around what people from different cultural backgrounds will behave like, which is, can be incredibly limiting for those people. I mean, you know, there's these, um, you know, there's a whole lot of, cliches that play out around who's assumed to be good at tech, for example, in architecture, who's assumed to be. Um, so I wonder if, um, if you might kind of talk a little bit about how we make space for those kinds of voices, for, for a range of voices, but also a range of different ways of operating. And, you know, this plays into gender as well, where women lead, uh, if women, women are meant to behave in certain ways and leadership, you know, show leadership in certain ways. And so there's these things kind of slice and dice in lots of ways around expectations of behavior and the way they overlap or are in tension with um, actual behavior. Does, does that make sense? Maybe not. You're going to have to simplify the question for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can't, yeah, yeah. Okay, how, do, how does one, how do, um, how can we make sure that these, uh, this thing of having multiple voices with diverse experience in the room is activated really well and how does one make space for those, vo for, to have, have, the, have a mix of voices um, because I think it can also, in a way that kind of over, um, jumps over the bias that Kataba was referring to. Um, well, um, I, th I think that there's kind of two ways to go about it. In my mind, you either, you either force it in like a wedge or with velvet gloves. Um, and maybe the way to go about it, I mean, 
again, I sort of, again, refer to my own personal experience because I'm not going to make That's what you're here for. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, um, I, I guess it's really important to know that um, everyone's background is valid, uh, even if you're white and a male. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's, that's, that's very important to acknowledge that everyone has a background and um, uh, non-ethnic people also have a story to tell. Um, so uh, I think it's a, probably a question of bridging a gap of understanding and the way to do it, I found, is by increasing the uh, the potential or the incident, like the, in, increasing the number of times or, or opportunities to have an incidental conversation with a bunch of people, and things like, you know, I hate the word networking. It's a bit of a naff word, but it is it is true. Meeting different people and talking about, uh, you know, all kinds of things, you know, like art, music. Uh, kids, things you hate, things you love, uh, just being honest and upfront and talking to a wide variety of people, different ages and what have you, about those uh, incidentally and naturally um, kind of creates a nice forum to start the conversation um, rather than like, uh, I'm in a, you know, like a conference and I'm just going to stand up there and uh, just say, uh, you know, brown people, Brown people um, have views too, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> God. Um, yeah, I think through incidental uh, meetings with people and just having chats with people, and I think slowly people's attitudes uh, do change and are changing. I find, I'm finding they are changing in my life. Um, so, you know, hey, you look at media and um, people that look like me are no longer, um, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, ethnic boyfriend number three. We're like, you know, um, we're playing lead roles I don't know. Right? Step forward. <laughs> I wondered if I could ask you, um, Sonia, about um, the scenario that you mentioned at the beginning there, which is absolutely fascinating, and whether there could have been a space in which you would have felt more comfortable. Well, how that space could have been one in which you felt more comfortable to speak up earlier. Because I'm sure that I'm sure there's a lot of people in this group, including myself, who have not said something because they've thought oh my God, this is so obvious. Why? It must be stupid. Therefore, I won't say it. <laughs> um, it seems so obvious to me. How come it's not obvious to them? Um, whereas if the space is safe, let's say, to use an overused word, but still, um, and it, or indeed actively encouraging, like if your boss or the planning officer had said, what do you think, Sonia? Mm -hmm. Then you would have said it. Um, yeah. I mean, what, what do you think about that? Well, <sighs> I want to say here that some, the word make space is fantastic. I love that phrase. However, my lived experience is that a lot of the times the heavy lifting to create that space has to be done by myself. Yeah. And that's unfair, you know? Um, so, however, um, as a course of that, I've also learned better to look out for our allies and recruit allies. And when you find that you start looking for allies and you have allies around you, that creates that sense of people get me, people get me fully for who I am and I can speak up. And it's, it's funny how that's, it's often the really tiny, tiny things that make a difference. Like, you know, when you share an offhand comment somewhere in another meeting that's completely unrelated, that you'd go, oh, you know, once um, I'd seen in Singapore that we'd done this and I thought that was great. If that comment goes, if the response is, Singapore, like what the fuck, how is that? A, sorry, shouldn't swear. Um, <laughs> how the hell is that applicable? If that's the reaction you get, that shuts you down. If the comment you get is, well, that's interesting, tell me more. Okay, so what was that about? If you show interest in those little things, the person starts opening up. Because they go, my difference is not shut out. It's actually welcome. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, I think it was two years before I had the courage to even wear this scarf to a casual Friday. All right. Otherwise, it was jeans and a T-shirt. Um, so one fine day, I decided to just go, screw it. I haven't done my laundry. I've only got my ethnic tops. I'm going to put that in, walk in. 
lots of oohs and ahs the first time. Second time, third time, not even commented on. Fantastic. My comfort level increased. That became my Friday uniform, not going, have I got my extra, you know, uh, t-shirt in the clean pile. Lastly, um, the little things again, you know, um, so much of the working calendar is, sorry, very December centric in terms of getting deadlines out. I mean, my Christmas is in the middle of October and there's no radar and you have to turn up that day and work and go, this is my Christmas. I am at work. Nobody has any idea. Do I speak up? Do I mention it or do I just shut down? But if there's a bit of a radar going, there's all these other festivals, there's all these other people in our office, you know, let's, let's let the office do the heavy lifting of going maybe oh yeah actually we've got someone with an Indian background we've got someone with an asian background today's chinese new year you know sometimes it can feel tokenistic i get it but sometimes it really makes a difference mm. you know, if it's actually coming from the other side and you're not having to make those suggestions so i suppose my problem is so many of the times i've had to do the heavy lifting and i've had to do the educating and it would be great if you know, I had had allies earlier to go. Hey, when's when's your big festival? You know that kind of thing. So, Sonia, I wonder. I mean, there's an excellent question here from uh, Badru Ahmed, which we will throw to in a second. But just before we do that, I wanted to ask you a bit more about allies. Like, what are the signs of an ally? How do you cultivate allies? Um, or, I mean, as you say, it's not necessarily your job to cultivate allies, but it might be allies' job to make themselves apparent to you. Um, and we would all like more allies in our workplaces. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Sadly, the process, Kuteba, you tell me if your lived experience is different. Sadly, the process it's been for me is when I've not had a negative interaction. Hmm. Um, it's by a process of elimination, sadly. <laughs> Um, so when a comment cuts you or, or hurts, um, which, you know, casual racism does, and often the reaction and the whiplash to that comes later, you later process who didn't laugh at that or who didn't feel comfortable with that. And you note, even in the midst of your shock, you notice. And then you just slowly, by a process of osmosis, realize that, that's the person who is your ally, um, the one who didn't join in um, or who didn't find that comment funny. Um, occasionally though, it's been glaringly obvious who's an ally because when the comment said, they're kind of looking around the room and going, how is that even funny? Mm. You know, and then you're like, right, right there, that's my ally. Mm. The one who's not in on the joke. Yes, yes. Um, Badra, would you like to pose your question about um, the, the, the pressure to be to act like an Australian? Uh, sorry, I was trying to turn on my uh, video, but that's not working. But hello, everyone. Uh, yes, so as I've already mentioned, um, I think I have to begin by saying that I don't think it's a reflection of the person I'm speaking with, but often a reflection of my own experiences. And I'm from Bangladesh, uh, but I've lived in Sri Lanka, I've lived in Portugal, and Australia is the third country I'm living in. And I must say, I'm quite settled here. I'm a resident here now. However, I often feel like I have to, when I say I got to sound like an Australian, like if I'm talking to someone from the building industry, I have to talk in a way that um, that comes off as, oh, I've got, I know the legislative structure in this country. Oh, I know you use this material over that material. And I often feel like I am, I cannot say, oh, why wouldn't you use this? Because this could be better. It works in that country because like uh, this discussion has already happened here that sometimes it's like, oh, it's shut down. It's like, oh, this is not how we do things here. Mm. And I don't know how to navigate that because there are people, of course, who appreciate a different opinion, but then there is also the point where you're like, oh, you know, this is not how we do things here. And sometimes I do wonder, please forgive me if that offends anyone in this conversation. Sometimes I wonder if it was a, white person saying that would that solution sound more acceptable or um sometimes every time i've given an interview i felt how many seconds do i have before i can break my stereotype because mm -hmm. my second name is ahmed so uh <laughs> that's about it yeah that's the question really what advice have you got to for someone in my position do you want to take that one kataba yeah sure um, so, well, I mean, 
it's interesting that uh, you said we don't do it this way uh, here. Uh, I've probably, in my experience, spoken to multiple builders and um, they, they would tell me that's not how we do it here because I don't want to build it that way kind of thing. So um, uh, I reckon that I have a feeling that the construction industry is just so full of risk that the tendency to try something new and innovate is is um, a little bit prohibitive. That's on the external part. But I suppose, you know, what, what strategy would you have um, to, to sort of address that? Um, I think that experience and confidence is, is one of these things that will get you over the line there. Um, it's, I don't think there is a silver bullet to deal with that kind of, uh, I suppose, what do you call it, uh, like a reactive attitude to new ideas, um, new ideas with, you know, where, from other, other, other parts of the world. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all I can offer. Sorry. Um, I'll <laughs> sure if I answered your question and I'm happy for you to have a rebuttal if you want to do. Um, I'll jump in. I would actually say um, ideas don't have a nationality. And if we're going to really pick apart things that don't work here, I could start rattling off a long list of things. Why are we building with concrete? Isn't that an Italian thing? Isn't that a European thing? The ideas that people are comfortable with are simply ideas that have not been here long enough. Where, when I first came here, I had so much uh, familiarity of building with concrete because that is how we build in Singapore. You'd suggest people to build stuff in concrete and they'd look at you like you were crazy because also it was very expensive. Now concrete is so ubiquitous. So sometimes it's a question of just pointing out to people that what feels odd to you or that will not work now is simply a matter of time. So you can either be ahead of the curve or you can catch up with the curve. That uh, very, very lovely response, especially regarding, you know, how you said uh, builders explaining that why, and that does make a lot of sense when you say that. But um, I often feel like I am limited, but again, this is a reflection of myself. I'm limited by my experience in this country and I feel like maybe five years later I'll be like look I know I've heard that been there done that yeah. you no know, this is the way to go but I suppose that there's a tight passage to it and you know we can only do our little part and make it a better place but thank you thank you for your responses thank you and I think that it, you know this goes to the the other side of the question so I of, of the topic I said we wanted to start off by talking about the opportunities but obviously of course we also need to talk about the biases that um you know we we've all we all face in different kinds of ways and you know I suppose particularly when we set up this session we were really interested in trying to provide um some kind of tips and guidance to young young people entering into the profession. I'm sorry, my daughter's here staring at me. Go away. <laughs> sorry. Uh, fine, do it. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to ignore her. Um, have a shower, go. Just, oh, sorry. <laughs> God, anyway. It's you, not my toddler. <laughs> I know, I've got a 13 year old. You'd think she could work it out. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, where was I going? Um, so, um, and this is another very broad question, but what what kind of, you know, as, as Badri said, it's, it's, you know, she kind of, it's about building, building um, confidence experience over time, which it is for all of us, but the playing field isn't even, we, we kind of know that. Um, we know that um, there's lots of research showing that um, people with non-Anglo names have a harder time getting an interview. And Tabor, I know you have direct experience that you can talk yes. to about this. Um, <laughs> Sonia, I know you've said to me in the past, you know, sometimes it's a relief that your, your, your first name kind of masks things. Um, yeah. So I wondered if you might both talk about your experiences a little bit there, but also um, I suppose offer, as people have been through this for some time now, offer some tips to the younger members of the audience about how, um, you know, obviously we all want to make the playing field even and we're, working, we're all trying to work to do that, but we do need to acknowledge that right now it's not. Um, so how can we give some people, what, what tips would you offer to, to those who come after you? 
and how to how to navigate this. Katabra, do you want to tell us your story or not? Yeah, I can tell you story. Um, I actually um, uh, a, a couple of years ago I did read the article that Sonia wrote, and um, in that she um, referenced this, an ANU study, which is what you just touched on, <clears throat> Justine. <clears throat> so I'll just read a little bit of from that. It just says. Uh, to as many interviews as an Anglo applicant with an Anglo sounding name, an indigenous person must submit 35% more applications. A Chinese person must submit 68% more applications. An Italian person must submit 12% more applications. And this one had really home there, the Middle Eastern person would submit 64% more applications. So that, that also is applicable to Ms. Ahmed as well. So <clears throat> what happened for me is that I graduated from the University of Auckland and of course, New Zealand was a bit of a basket case at one point, hence why Justina and I are here. Um, <clears throat> Wish we were there now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, uh, so I moved to um, Queensland at, at the time and I, I was applying for jobs and I remember I kind of got really frustrated thinking oh, I was just not good enough um, and I insist that catch 22 where you need experience to get experience, but you can't get experience because you need experience. So it's very tough for um, graduates to break in and get their first role. And essentially is just, a, you know, a leap of faith from your employ employer. Um, and so, um, my landlady lady at the time, Rosemary, I still remember her name. She, she said to me, um, Hey love, you know, why don't you just, I don't know, try just applying with an Anglo name you know, and I, I just got really mad. I remember I thought, you know, I left uni with, oh, um, I don't know, egalitarian ideals that no, my race doesn't mean anything. It's all about my merit kind of thing. Um, but it, it did. And I changed my name to, I don't mind telling you, it was Tom. I called myself Tom. And um, I got an interview straight away. I think that same week, it could be a coincidence. I have to say this It's very important to say that this is just anecdotal um, stuff here. Uh, and um, and yeah, I lived in, in Queensland for a bit, practiced there for a couple of years and my name was Tom and I didn't really like it and kind of, it became a bit of a, a bit of a stigma for me. So when I moved to um, uh, Melbourne, got my first job and um, I interviewed um, with now my mentors, um, you know, I, I said to them, <laughs> um, oh yeah, just by the way, oh, we, thanks for offering me the job. Yes, I'll take it. Um, yeah, pay is good. Um, by the way, my name is Kataba, and they're like, what, you know? And so it's kind of, it was kind of a bit like reclaiming my name, I suppose. Um, and um, look, I came away with it thinking, you know, like most people probably listening here, you know, woe is me, why me kind of thing. Um, and it's very easy to ex completely externalize socio issues like that. Um, and a lot of it is external, like, you know, it's very important to acknowledge that what's what I, now I understand as implicit bias actually exists. Yeah. Um, and, but I kind of have really moved away from blaming other people. And that includes, that includes, you know, white people. Um, and, I, you know, at one point, to quote Ali G, I used to think, is it because I was black, you know, like, but, you know, it is a little bit, but also you can take a, a lot more proactive role. Um, and look, I probably have spoken a lot, so I might sort of cede my time to, to Sonia to add to that before I give anyone what I refer to as, as tips that from my experience. So um, over to you, Sonia. Well, I've clearly had an easier ride than Kuteba because my name is quite generic and my first name at least is quite generic. Um, however, I have, and I have no problem admitting that if you are someone who has more than one layer of difference, it's a double um, jeopardy. So I am not only a woman in a male profession, I am a person of color in a male white profession. So. I think there has to be that acknowledgement that you're fighting so much more because the thing I've had to fight against is this impression that I am uh, not dissimilar to what um, black women in America face is that I'm angry, 
I'm outspoken, um, all those other things. So those are the things I've had to battle with, even though my name has not been as much of a hurdle. The minute I turn up, people, you know, things that are said innocently are often taken as if I have said that argumentatively. And I've gone back and thought about the words and gone, I wasn't picking an argument there. So, you know, even though, even though it isn't the name that is the baggage, it is literally this reflection that is the baggage for the other person at the other end, thinking I'm um, just waiting for a fight. Um, the thing I would say there, and I, I don't know what tip I have, but I am slightly at difference from Kuteba in the sense that I do believe if there's one thing that Black Lives Matter has highlighted, it is that you cannot change anything unless you try to tackle a system. And my soapbox is that I am determined that someday hiring in architecture will stop being so informal and that we will have blind applications. The government is doing it. I'm not proposing something that no one in Australia does. Um, the, that is how government hires. Um, your personal details are all stripped away from the app application and literally just your credentials are on the table and your response to this question. My favorite anecdote is the Boston Symphony, where they had, where for, for decades, the diversity of musicians in terms of gender, ethnicity has been fantastic. But the argument was always that, well, we have people perform on the stage and it's based on their performance. And then one year um, as an experiment, the auditions were done behind a black screen the person who was auditioning couldn't speak. You had no idea who they were. You could simply hear what they played. And suddenly, lo and behold, in three years' time, you had a reflection in that symphony of the ethnic and, well, gender diversity of our population, which is 50 50. You change the system, you change the outcome. If you change how, you know, as they say in the US, if you change how incarceration works and policing works, you change the outcome. Similarly, if you change how hiring works, which is the biggest cliff that someone who is of a diverse background, that first hiring step, if you change that, I hope you can change the outcome. Mm. Sorry, pet project of mine. <laughs> no, I absolutely agree. And I think, um, you know, the, the informal processes of architecture um, can really very much lead to, I mean, Naomi and I have been talking about the sort of in crowds and out crowds and how that all works in multiple, multiple different ways. But architecture's very informal processes. Um, you know, charming though some of them are, have some very serious um, impacts. And I absolutely agree. And certainly our, um, you know, when we did the parlor guides to recruitment a very long time ago, I think we, we tried to cover this. I think the other, um, the story I like about the orchestra too is I think they did it behind a black screen and they could still hear women's high heels. So they made everyone do it with their, without their sock shoes on. And they kind of, anyway. Okay, where are we at? To, so, so what, but what, advice, what advice do you have for our audience, um, both as young people in the profession, but also I think really um, in terms of um, what, we can, what people can do to offer to, you know, to, to be upstanders, not bystanders, as they say in the kind of language of, of, of the sort of gender equity. Um, how can we help our friends and colleagues, all of us? Um, how can we all contribute to these kind of much more inclusive and um, open cultures? But also, what can the people here, particularly the young people heading out into the profession in these very difficult times, what would you suggest? I mean, Table, would you would you recommend people do change their names? No, no. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you can't beat yourself for it. It's um, it's what is it? Short term gain. <laughs> yeah, I was reading um, a, a Twitter conversation a while ago about, about this, and someone was saying they they changed it to the point where they thought they're about to get the job, and then did what you did and switched. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what is that? Reverse chicken on chickening yeah. on. <laughs> um, well. I think, um, oh, this is going to sound like a Tony Robbins personal power to tape, I suppose. But um, I think the number one thing, if I was ever going to give anyone a tip, is to, um, I, I mentioned one just before, which is kind of, you know, accept that implicit bias exists. Like it just, it's, it's a reality and people are working to change it. Um, so it, it's there. Um, 
and also meeting different people and, and, and talking to different people of all, all walks, consultants, what have you, um, will help you not only advocate, um, challenge the, the bias. Um, and um, yeah, I think people d do change their point of views in some instances. Um, I think the other one is to um, just like work to be a real gun at what you do like be exceptional at your job and stop looking around just put your head down and your bum up and someone said to me one uh, recently that a career is is very much a marathon and not a sprint it's a it's a slow burn it's something that takes a while to do and you keep working at it and it's interesting like if you think about it i watched the um oh what is it called michael jordan it's on netflix whatever it is but Michael Jordan's black, right? But with six NBA championships, no one talks about his blackness. They talk about his greatness. And so the last dance, thank you very much, Makarina. Um, yeah, so it's like, you know, believe in the ideals of meritocracy and they are ideals, unfortunately, but, but you know, we're, we're getting there hopefully and be okay with rejection sometimes. Um, <clears throat> and the last one is, you are exceptionally different if you're if you're ethnically diverse and and that's okay and it's a good thing so find your voice be comfortable and find your voice um yeah um i have a slight problem with the put your head down bum up because i feel like i do have to work twice as hard as anybody else sometimes but i get i get where kuteba is coming from and yeah, the, the reality is you are cut a lot less slack. Um, but my experience of... Okay, sorry, can I just uh, rebut there? Cut, cut a lot less slack than who? Than someone who isn't in your shoes. Yeah, well, okay, so <clears throat> I'm just going to sort of differ on, on this, um, Sonia, and respectfully. Um, so what, what we're talking about today is... is under the term of identity politics, right? Like this is what we're doing. And I think, I think identity politics, in my view, um, has a place to play and it very much is, is working towards a remedy to resolve this. However, I feel some of it's a little bit problematic and, um, and what it does do um, as a byproduct, not a, not a, not a direct um, objective, is it kind of creates rifts mini rifts see the problem that in my view that we're dealing with is that it's kind of a you know human beings are, are a bunch of tribes and they always have been and um, you always look after your tribe and you know like if we so for example like i kind of i came to one of the parlor meetings and 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 i sort of i spoke up and i uh, at the time i said hey um you know it's it's like it seems to be a fairly middle class female conversation here, right? And I haven't, I bet that time, I must admit, Sonia, I hadn't read your, your, uh, your article, so you have to forgive me. But I said, well, you know, race is also a thing, you know? <clears throat> and so if I say that, then people with disabilities would say that, and people would, you know, and then you can keep fra you fragmenting it um, ad infinitum. And so I'm just wondering, like, yeah, it's harder for you and harder for me to a different degree, but that's is how much of that is to be expected. <clears throat> oh yeah, I uh, don't get me wrong. I just uh, I just struggle with that message um, of you know I feel um, I feel Michael Jordan had to work six times harder also to get noticed, you know, um, etc. So. I think we're in agreement in general. I also do not see every hurdle I've uh, faced as a function of my gender or my brownness. In fact, it's amazing how many times I am completely blind to my gender and brownness. And actually, it's only certain instances that make me go whiplash and go, wow, okay, maybe it is a problem. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't see the world with those blinkers. I don't see the world with those cracks. But it's sometimes the situation makes you go, oh, wait a minute, I am this. Like, you know, that's not my daily existence. I'm brown, I'm female. That's not what I'm talking about. But I agree with you there. It, it has a counterproductive outcome beyond a certain point. The main thing I wanted to answer Justine's question was based on previous 
two cycles of some really dire economic circumstances. Um, what I would like to, um, what advice I would have is um, um, the knowledge that nothing is ever wasted. I have turned, you know, it, there was something called the Asian financial crisis when I graduated from my first degree. Um, and I landed up in a practice that was very different from my dream practice and is very different from the practice that I have now. And yet there is so much I took from that practice, even though it wasn't perfect or, you know, a, a, like the top winning, award winning, blah, blah, blah. But there is so much I learned there that I actually still apply to small practice. And if you had told me that, I would have never believed you. I would have thought, I would have told you, no, I need to have experience in a boutique small practice because I want to be in a boutique small practice. So the thing I want to say is nothing is ever wasted. That is what I learned from the first sort of, you know, struggle that I had with a, a difficult um, economic circumstances, which is what COVID has brought us here to. And the second time around with the GFC, I was a fresh master's graduate. And I think um, GFC cracked on the September. I graduated in the December and I went, oh my God, I, I, there are no jobs. Um, and the person that I was working with part-time did offer me full-time. And you know, I was just very shocked and very grateful. And I was like, I was just quietly just walking here, no problem, like, you know, not gonna rock the boat. And I was surprised because I was kept on while someone else wasn't. And it took me quite some time to ask why was I kept on? Like, what, why? Um, and the answer was, you're a bit more of a jack of all trades. And so the thing I would like to say is make your skill set diverse because it's amazing how much a person who is of a diverse skill set is a lot more valued in certain tough circumstances than a person who is a specialist. And I know this may seem counterintuitive because often as a profession, we see ourselves as specialists. But then again, I also think our profession is a very generalist profession. When we graduate, we can design any kind of building. So those two things, nothing is ever wasted and be a jack of all trades. You have all the time in your later career to be a master of this one thing that you're super passionate about. Like, for example, I'm really actually you know, thrilled to hear what Kujay was kind of getting down into these days. So you've got time later to be the master. The help of what other people can do to, to help is ask questions, ask people their stories. Um, and the thing I would also say to the person who says in my shoes is share stories. The more we share stories, the more we stop being in our boxes. Because as humans, there is nothing more simple and primal than to just co connect to stories. We've been sharing them for millions of years. So share as many stories of your other experiences, your lived experiences, the patterns you've seen of how we've lived. Have confidence in that because the one thing nobody can undermine, they can undermine your skill, but they cannot undermine your lived experience. If you have truly seen how a Middle Eastern bazaar works and analyzed it, your lived experience gives you the confidence to talk about that. So that's what I would say. And, the, and, and for the people who would like to be allies, I would say, um, perhaps give people a bit of your time, offer to review their cover letter, um, because the cover letter is often where people who come from a much more formal training in English is a stumbling block, because the way people work here within offices is a much more casual level of, um, of, of English. And so often to me, that is the biggest hurdle that I often call up um, applicants of diverse background and go, just tone down the cover letter a bit, make it much more conversational and simple. And that's not their fault. That's just the um, background that they're coming from, which is that English is used extremely formally in those settings. Whereas in Australia, it's the complete opposite. Give them your time. Give them your time to go through interview questions and give them the practice of talking about themselves. Because I know, I mean, again, I can like Kuteba, I can only speak for myself. Um, I often come from a background where, you know, if there's an older person talking to me, my job is more to listen than to speak about myself. Um, and you have to give them that confidence to you know, talk about yourself a bit more. So these are the things you can do to help, I think. Give them your time. That's great. Naomi. We're nearly, we're nearly out of time, Justine. We're nearly we out of time. We've got another, I know we haven't taken as many questions as, as we sometimes do, uh, but we've, and I know we've already had Badri, but Badri's got a re another really good question. Do you think we can quickly? Yes, let's Badri, do it. do you want to ask you a question about... Um, potential benefits of adapting to different cultures? Yes, so this is something that I often feel um, how, like it's just an observation. Sometimes I feel, especially international students, do not 
adapt to the culture. Like they, they're so focused within their own circles and within their own communities that they're not going out to the next person and speaking to them. And then they say, oh, they're not talking to us. But hey, have you gone and said hi? And this is also from my observation. And I was just wondering what advice the panelists had for, uh, like sometimes I want to tell these friends, like, hey, you know what? You need to talk to the others because most people I've talked to hasn't been rude to me. You may not drink alcohol, but um, it's okay to get a glass of soda and still hang out with your colleagues after work. So no one's going to force you to drink alcohol. No one has to me either. I, mean, I do, but just saying. So um, what advice would the panelists have uh, for people to be aware that you can have roots and you can have wings. You can have them both. You don't have to, it ha doesn't have to be any one of those. I like how you put it, roots. roots wings. Yeah, I love That's that. I love it. Poetic. <laughs> <laughs> Let me write that down for a second. <laughs> uh, why isn't my video camera working? <laughs> don't worry, I've got your name emblazoned in my brain. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just I have to say this in between, although we're running over time. I do quite, for Kateba, I do quite love the fact that my name is so unique. No one forgets my name. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> no one can say my name, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, now I'll let you be. Um, I, I might sort of uh, t tackle that um, for a sec. Um, I think, uh, well, Sonia used the word allies. I probably would use something a bit different because allies um, would um, suggest there are um, enemies. Um, oh. <laughs> Good point. Um, uh, well, um, uh, well, I'm going to use your, your language for a second. Um, uh, if a good way for me to know allies is, um, I like to do karaoke and uh, I like to go to dumplings every now and then. And if you're not, well, you're not an ally of mine kind of thing, but there are other things you can do. Um, uh, you know, like I think, uh, you know, Alcohol is a tough one for people who are from a Muslim background, especially uh, because it is such a social lubricant. Um, it is absolutely everyone sort of puts their guards, lowers them appropriately where the incidental stuff can absolutely occur. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, I, just, I look back and I think, when have my most meaningful conversations with absolute strangers have happened? When we're drunk. Um, so that's a kind of a, that's a big one to, to, to get over. However, that's not the only social lubricant. So are dumplings, you know, I don't know, food. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it's, you're absolutely right. You actually, you do need to, uh, as an international student, um, be conversant with this soup of a culture um, and actually you'd be adding ingredients to it, if anything. So I think you've got to just play an active role. I think my main my main sort of message here, if you want to take away one thing, is don't lay back and be the victim. Play oh. the active role. Yeah, no, lovely advice. Absolutely, I'm fully in agreement with Kuteba there. Um, there is a lot of work for both sides to be done. You can't sit back and expect everyone else to do the heavy lifting for you. Absolutely not. Um, what I would like to say there is that in any stage of life, if you're in a homogenous group. I like to, I, it's, it's strange. The human brain is more motivated by the, by the stick than the carrot sometimes. Mm. And I used to start to tell people, gosh, you're missing out on so much. You know, um, you're missing out on like, imagine if I had to, well, actually, if you told this to my daughter that she had to eat Indian food every single day of the day a week, she'd be like, um, all that awesomeness I'm missing out on, you know? Food is a great analogy for that. And so we get bored of things easily. Like it's the same thing. There is this amazing variety of people around you. Why wouldn't you want to sample their brains? You know, oh, absolutely, hundred percent. Confusion both ways. And uh, I love looking at other. I love hearing other people's point way of looking at things. Just like you know, my way of looking at things is really obvious to me when I hear. You know, especially you know, Justine and that little Kiwi brain, lovely Kiwi brain of hers. I always go, wow, why didn't I think of that? And, you know, that's a function of Justine and Naomi and, uh, and all these things. So the, the wider your circle is, um, yeah, to borrow from Kuteba, the more delicious that brain soup gets. Now, why would you want to miss out on all that, this opportunity of moving halfway around the earth has offered you? Mm. Well, and on that note, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Kateba and Sonia. Um, 
it's been a really fascinating conversation. There was an excellent question also from way back in time from Arij Hashmi Wayman, which we didn't get to, but it was about education, the role of education in tackling cultural ignorance, which is a very, very good question. And maybe we'll address it next time. So um, Justine, do you have any closing remarks? Um, only that um, I, I, I think that that advice is, is really important and valuable and I would encourage the young ones in our audience uh, or, the, or the grads of whatever age, students and grads of whatever age, on uh, this coming Monday we've got the third of our Midday Monday sessions, um, uh, which is student-led, student-run, um, really aiming to create spaces for students and new graduates to get together. Um, ideally, we're keen to have people from different uh, from across Australia, meet each other, and it really is that vehicle for getting together, getting to know each other. Um, and so, I think that you all, we've, that's one of the things we've been talking about is you know just kind of expanding your networks, getting and um, telling stories, and that's really the, a, a very good vehicle for that. It's coming along really well, and, and Bronwyn and Sarah, who are running that, are doing an amazing job. So, I encourage. Um, you, you know, that is for the students and grads, but if, if that's you, I really encourage you to go along. Um, and of course, we, uh, you know, Parla calls itself a space to speak. We really do want to try and make spaces for these conversations. So, um, uh, yes, keep, <laughs> keep so, coming Sonia, along and keep telling us what you want. <laughs> and Sonia, Sonia, do you want the last word? Sorry, no, I don't want the last word. I just remembered something that I didn't manage to uh, bring up in that conversation um, with Badru, the last question about international students. One thing to be mindful of is so much of what Kuteba and I talk, are talking about is a process. And at some point of time, you're going to be doing it really well. And sometimes you're not going to be do doing it really well. And often as new immigrants, you know, there's a lot of uh, change and things like that. And often, yes, you do get a lot of things wrong, like staying in your own little groups. But with time, people unfurl. And so I suppose to anyone who is, you know, thinking about this topic, time is a big factor. Oh, absolutely. Yes. 100% on that. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a fascinating conversation and it will be recorded and up on the Parlour website as usual in a couple of weeks. Thank you particularly to Sonia and Kateba, our wonderful speakers. Um, Sonia and Kateba, do you want to stay on the line and we'll have a little debrief and thanks everyone else. See you next week.